All right, Joe, how are you, man? I'm so excited to have you here on the Trauma Informed Educators Network podcast. I've thrown you into the live world here, and I cannot wait to have this conversation. So, how are you? Tell tell us about the tell us about Joe. Tell us your story. Uh, one, thanks for thanks for having me. Two, thanks for the the endorsement of the book on the back cover. That was very sweet. Um, and so the story, uh, really crazy story. Um, back when I was, uh, I, I mean, I grew up in in sort of a a, a world of trauma. And so I, I grew up a bullied kid, you know, a young gay kid in a Catholic school. And so I, I definitely got my fair share of, of, of trauma from school. I grew up in a home life that had enough trauma to uh, write another book. And then on top of that, when I was 20 years old, I was, I was pretty viciously gay bashed and beaten up and pretty much left for dead. Um, I, I spent, you know, a couple years kind of healing from that. And part of that healing was just trying to figure out why people would do anything like that in the first place. I don't have it in me uh, to hit a human being. I would hit a wall before I hit a person. And so I didn't understand that. And I started figuring it out and, and, and at least getting to a place where I felt healed in some way. And then in 2000, I was leaving a downtown Providence, Rhode Island nightclub and was body slammed to the ground um, by some young men running down the street yelling nasty things about gay people. Um, broke my collarbone, had some head injuries. Um, to this day, I don't remember most of the 12 hours before it. Um, and so I, it somehow put me on this path th that wasn't a far reach for me. It was this path of, I want to understand violence. And so that somehow drove me to becoming a mediator, to uh, learning about nonviolence, becoming a nonviolence trainer in schools. Um, and then somehow I, I ended up the associate director of a mediation center. And part of my new job was going to be going into schools to set up peer mediation programs. And then I have to admit, I would go into schools and I would listen to teachers and adults talk to children. And I kind of cringed a little, you know, I, I've spent all this time in a conflict world doing mediations, doing small claims court. I'd been trained in victim offender mediations by VOMA back in like 2007 or 2008. I've been trained by VOMA and I had some understanding of, of conflict. And I started to realize that there's a lot of overlap between classroom management and conflict management. I mean, it's just conflict. It's not, you know, for me being a conflict guy, that was like, well, let me, let me show you some stuff here. And so I talked to principal of this school. Um, I, I said, could you let me do a conflict and communication training with your staff? I, I bet we could turn some of this around and, and reduce some of the issues in classrooms. Um, so I did a couple of trainings. The staff literally ate it up. And I was like, oh, well, this is this is cool. And, and so the next thing you know, I went to the next school. And the way that it seemed to work for me was that I would go into a school and have a bunch of really successful stuff happen. And then the assistant principal would leave and become the principal of another school. And the first thing they would do is bring me there. And so I would go and do another training. And so I felt like, oh, my gosh, I have to learn more. And so that dove me into learning about trauma, learning about restorative justice and deeper levels and how schools were doing it. And I'd already had a mental health background. I'd worked in mental health in the early 2000s. And so I understood trauma. Uh, I, I had understood PTSD. I already suffered from PTSD. So I kind of had firsthand knowledge of it. I knew what panic attacks look like. Um, I'd had them. And so, you know, as I started to understand what classrooms could look like to help kids, I realized I was just setting up classrooms because that's what I would have wanted. This is the classroom I would have wanted and the people I would have wanted to be around. Uh, and so somehow now I'm here with a book. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, an amazing book. I mean, a remarkable book. And and I think, too, your your life's journey has been so interesting to hear all of these different intersections and how you ended up with a book. Um, because 
I think that the intersections that I'm interested to hear from you are the intersection of trauma informed approaches and restorative justice. How do those two things intersect? Because I think naturally as a trauma informed person, it makes sense to me. And so looking at those two perspectives, how do you see them intersecting and what misconceptions do you commonly see between the two? Well, so the intersection's interesting because I've never had one. <laughs> They've always been the same stuff to me. Um, the focus on relationships, the focus on uh, this idea of acknowledging each other's humanity. Those elements, like, they exist in both worlds. Yet, if I went to the trauma-informed schools conferences, I'm the only guy there talking about restorative justice. And then when you go to the restorative justice conferences, there's only a handful of people talking about trauma. Of course, those are all the sessions I went to. And it started, like, I didn't understand why these two worlds didn't live together because the overlap of, of principle is, is so deep. Um, and, and the myth of it is that, and, and, and still today, there are people in the restorative justice field or community that are like, this is already trauma-informed. And the answer is, no, it's not. If we are not, if it is not on our radar to think about how kids experience being in circle together, how kids experience a restorative chat, using the restorative questions, why are you asking those questions in the first place? Who are you asking those questions to and what has been their story? And we start to realize that not everything without this mindset of how trauma impacts development, how it impacts behavior, you could be actually trying to hold kids accountable for bottom-up behavior. In other words, adaptive behaviors that are meant to protect them, and you're trying to circle them up and hold them accountable for something they can't control. Yeah, that doesn't work. And so I think the restorative justice world is run in this sense that, you know, we want to hold kids accountable, do it non-punitively, which is sounds right off the start trauma-informed, except if you're doing that and you don't understand that these kids don't really have the control of their behavior that you want them to, then you're probably just re-traumatizing them. And so that's where sort of the intersection needs to come, that, that you know, restorative justice is not inherently trauma-informed, although trauma-informed principles are inherently restorative. That's, I mean, that's so interesting uh, to hear you talk through it because you're, you're exactly right. And, and, you know, and I know restorative justice and restorative practices, it's big on not shaming, right? But I've also learned that shame can still be in the roots and depth of some of those practices if they're not done correctly, right? And then they're not done in a way that is truly in the process. And then you get to that neuroscience piece where kids might be reacting in ways they're not in control of themselves, yet the approach is you are in control of yourself. I love that. And and how did you how did you get to this the sector of going, these are these two separate worlds? I yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I literally just don't. I mean, I went to a lot of conferences. I I did a, a, a lot. I'm a, I literally am a book junkie. Like you can't see the rest of this room that I'm in, but it's filled with books. Um, I don't watch television. And so I spend a lot of my time reading. I read a lot of books about trauma. Uh, I read a lot of books about restorative justice. And, and, and I'm not going to lie. Some of it I did because I'm still trying to heal. As a, you know, a human being who's been the subject of violence, I'm still trying to heal. As a kid that was badly bullied as a kid, you know, I'm still trying to heal. And so, of course, I want to read a lot of books on trauma and restorative justice and, and you know, uh, because I wanted to know that stuff for myself. But that drive to know also means I started reading everything I could get my hands on. And you know, once you've gotten through Bruce Perry and Mona Delahook and 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 uh, it, you know uh, Dan Siegel and like just name these names, uh, you know uh, Nadine Burke Harris is like uh, unbelievable with writing metaphors that help you understand this stuff. Um, 
it, the intersection just seems so obvious to me. But it also seemed obvious to me to blend in the work of Marshall Rosenberg and his ideas of nonviolent communication, which literally changed my life when I read about it. I, I found Marshall Rosenberg's work. It, one night I was watching YouTube, of all things, like two o'clock in the morning, I'm watching YouTube, because what else do you do at two o'clock in the morning? And I saw this video of Marshall Rosenberg, and he started the video by saying, I started with two questions. Why do some people enjoy violence while other people enjoy compassionate giving? And I was like, all right, I, I'm hooked. <laughs> and, and I just started reading all of his work. But un interestingly enough, Marshall's sort of fundamental principles for nonviolent communication are pretty much restorative justice and trauma-informed wrapped up. Um, it's not perfect, it, 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 there, but the overlap is ridiculous. So and when, then, when you say nonviolent communication, what is that – what is that sound? What is what is that? Like if, if somebody's listening, they're like nonviolent communication, what does that mean? What does that mean to Joe? And based off of the work you just said, um, <laughs> what is what is nonviolent communication? I mean, obviously we know what nonviolent is, we know what communication, but in the context, what what does that mean? So Marshall Rosenberg uh was a guy who uh he grew up during the race riots in Detroit. And really you know went on to become a psychologist he decided that he wanted to stop being a psychologist because he he didn't want to diagnose people anymore because he felt like the diagnosis wasn't helpful that he was really just doing it to get paid by insurance companies and so he quit being a psychologist and seeing patients and became a taxi driver and during this time as a taxi driver he started putting together this model of communication that was also based in Gandhi's principles of nonviolence. It's super easy, you know, mechanics, but it came with these sort of fundamental ideas of how we use language and why we use language. Like, why are you talking in the first place? And to sum it up really, I guess really, is that Marshall decided that we use language currently to get people to do stuff. We use coercion, manipulation, bribes, punishments, rewards. Um, and he's like, as long as you're doing that, language just becomes manipulation, which then, of course, becomes domination, which becomes violence and supports violence. And he shows you in his books like how this is supported. And I talked about I actually took some of his ideas and found more science to back up his ideas in my book. And he found that we could change the way we use language to have one goal, Con connect, just connect. So I'm not trying to get you to do something. I just want to connect with your experience. And I want you to be able to connect with my experience. Well, wait a minute. We're talking trauma-informed schools. Isn't that exactly what we need to do with a kid that's in stress, a kid that's like dysregulated? We need to connect with their experience. I mean, they need to connect with ours so that relationship makes safety. Well, it seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, honestly, it's not just the kid that's dysregulated. It's everyone, right? It's yeah. the administrator to the teacher. It's the teacher to the administrator. It's the, the, the administrator to the parent. It's the teacher to the student. It's the principal to the student. It's That is the whole goal. And I think what you just said sums up trauma-informed education in like a nice little package. And then you ask, add that restorative piece. So merging those two, it makes sense. And that's what you get to your, in your book. So let's talk a little bit about your book, um, building a trauma informed restorative school. Right. And I think that it, it has all of these pieces. So what, tell us about the layout of the book and, and how a reader can, can access the information when they do get your book, because I know they all will. So, so tell about the layout of the book and how you've set it up and structured it. So the, the layout's really interesting and, and got rearranged during the editing and writing process. And so um, the first part of the book really is talking about a paradigm shift, you know, no, no pun intended. Um, it, it is the paradigm shift. We have to get our lens changed. 
and see behavior differently. And so, you know, to borrow a little Ross Green, which the beginning of my book is filled with a lot of Ross Green, that in this idea that kids are not in deliberate control of their challenging behavior. That behavior is really not a motivation problem. Again, it was on this show that we heard Bruce Perry say that punishments and rewards will help um, motivate kids to use skills they already have, but it mm -hmm. won't teach them any new skills. Well, then what the hell are you doing with it? <laughs> and so right. why not focus the way we do behavior to recognize that if a kid isn't behaving the way that you expect them to, one, look at your expectations. Are they even realistic? Are they equitable? <laughs> are, yeah. are you expecting kids to do things that are quite frankly, not cool to start with? Once you've ruled that out, then let's look at the second part. Do they have the skills to do what you're asking? And they might not. And so self-regulation skills, uh, sequential order thinking, language processing, like every kid is in a different place. And so um, I, I think part of this thinking is, can we start seeing children's behavior as a struggle instead of in trouble? And so like one of the things I started saying this, I don't I think I started saying it when I was in schools really early on is I kept see, hearing teachers say that the kids get in trouble and I'm like, they're not in trouble. They're in struggle. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not, they're not sitting there trying to find a reason to be punished. They're just struggling to figure out the world. And you know, Joe, I, I give this scenario all the time when it comes to something like that of, okay, so let's say you just lost a loved one and you're at the funeral and you are feeling all of those emotions and somebody comes up to you and says, uh, you need to calm down. You, you need to calm down. Yeah. That's what we do to kids all the time at school who are in toxic stress, who are in traumatic experiences. They're in that, that same emotional state that we might experience in a funeral all of the time. And yet we expect them to come in, sit down, be quiet and do what they're told. And that is unrealistic. And what you just said is we're setting unrealistic expectations and we're not even going to get into, and we may later, we may not even get into what expectations that we're setting and what norm that is set upon, probably a white, predominantly white authoritarian uh, uh, expectation. We're setting these on so many kids. I, I love that. And, and, then, and again, like I said, I'm sorry, I, I, I connect to what people say and that just resonated with me of man do we just tell kids to do things they may one not have the skill to do and two it may not even be realistic so so powerful yeah mm. so the first part of the book really asked you to change your lens the the second part really is skill building that in order for us to do this i'm sorry you you have to learn how to do some things like talk <laughs> which i know most educators are like i know how to communicate and the reality is very few, very few of us really know how to talk, especially when we're stressed in ways that are not promoting a violence and not triggering people off. So we need to learn how to do five skills. So this book has five skills that I call the five skills of restorative. And they are empathy, the ability to just really be present and listen. Uh, honest expression, which is a term that comes right from Marsha Rosenberg. Uh, it is basically I statements on steroids, um, really focused I statements. Um, and so out there in the world right now, there are uh, restorative practitioners using something called effective statements. I hate them. I, I Anyone that's hit my website has read an article called uh, Making Effective Statements More Effective because they're really just sounding like blame. And so I, I use Marshall Rosenberg's honest expression, observation, feeling, need, request. Pretty simple formula. And so empathy, honest expression, learning how to ask problem solving questions. Questions are really important in trauma-informed and restorative because we need to be able to talk to kids who are generally the answers they give us are kind of, oh, you know, that's that's oh. children's answers. Yeah. But if you ask the right questions in the right ways, you can actually peel back the onion, mm -hmm. break apart the problems that they're struggling with and help them solve those problems collaboratively. And so there's a, a, this idea of, of learning how to ask great questions, but also within circle to get the real dialogues going, we need to ask great questions. 
The, the next skill on there is what I call the art of requests. How do we ask children to repair the harm that they've caused in developmentally age appropriate, um, culturally appropriate ways that are, that are actually about healing everyone involved? What's that action plan look like? And, and so oftentimes kids mess up and especially in the restorative justice world, we're very focused about not being punitive, but you still caused harm. And the kids who you harmed deserve just as much uh, to be acknowledged for their feelings. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes when a kid messes up in class, we deal with that kid. Mm -hmm. well, what about the rest of them? Do they right. not count? And so it, this method of really looking at things says, if we're gonna hold you accountable, it is as a community because community justice and restorative justice are sort of intertwined. The last skill is, is a skill and a practice, and that is mindfulness. In order for, for us to do any of this, we've got to get to a place where we can show up. Much like nonviolent communication, mindfulness has been a really big part of my recovery and my own healing. Um, it's, I, I think it's done wonders at keeping my nervous system from, from going wacky um, as often as it used to. And so I don't have as many like moments of like panic that I used to have. Um, and I really attribute a practice of mindfulness to that. I, I meditate every day. Um, I sometimes meditate throughout the day just because I can. If you're going to be stuck in line at the grocery store doing nothing, you might as well breathe for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the five skills. So section two of the book really helps you develop the skills. So then in those moments of like test, we, we've got skills to fall back on. Um, and then the rest of the book talks about practices, circle practice, restorative chats, um, using de-escalation spaces. Um, I, I really want people to learn the different ways of using circle, both for academic purposes, but also for, for community building purposes. Mm -hmm. And then the very last section of the book is, uh, which my husband, is told me a thousand times should have been the first section of the book is written about implementation. How do you actually do this? Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about myths, you know, one of the myths that everybody has about trauma informed and restorative practices is that you just go in, train everybody and this will work out. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. The other myth I think is that we can do this in a six month period or a year. Also not true. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you're really looking at three to five years worth of constant work and without structural changes, there's no way this is going to work. And so you can't do restorative justice circles to build community if you have nowhere in your schedule to do that. It's true. If your referral form doesn't reflect um, restorative choices, then you're still stuck with detention suspension and, and no choice for restorative chat. So we need to start really looking at structural changes, procedural changes that come from the top down to the bottom up. And so teachers, parents, student voice. It's one of the things I love about Cardona as a secretary of education choice is he's big on student voice. And so, you know, let's 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 bring those things and and make sure that everybody understands how change happens so a conversation that's not happening in the restorative justice world not happening in the trauma-informed world we're so busy talking about the content of trauma-informed the content of restorative justice we're not talking about change management how do you make change in a school building and that's not like making change anywhere else schools are their own thing and and man did i and i'm not a teacher and so when I started going into schools, you you and I both know the first thing that got yelled at me, you've never been in the classroom. You don't know. Well, I, I've been this road before as I actually see the name in the right hand corner there. Uh, one of my, my buddies and I did some trainings together for the police. And one of the police officers looked at me and he said, Joe, you, you need to do some ride alongs with us before you do any more training with us. And I was like, fair All enough. Right. Mm -hmm. So I did the same thing when I got to teachers. I just started spending hundreds of hours in classrooms with teachers. And, and it's funny because I see some of those teachers' names hiding in this column here, whose, nice. whose classrooms I, I just hung out in the back of the room. And I watched and I observed and I asked questions. And amazingly, teachers just let me come back. 
And, and eventually they were like, could you teach us how to do circle? Could you teach us how to do respect agreements? Which I, I think every classroom should have a respect agreement um, that's built off narrative. So what we're doing right now with respect agreements and, and sort of classroom contracts or class norms is a teacher stands at the front of the room, probably white, and says, how do y'all want to respect each other? And then kids are people pleasers. So they say, mm -hmm. ooh, one person talks at a time. Raise your hand. They say exactly what she wants to hear. Absolute programming, which right? Is I meaningless. Mean, that's what right. But it also means that a white teacher is dictating what respect will look like. Mm -hmm. Eye contact, blah, 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 blah. Well, let's put this back on kids. Let's actually have them tell their stories about respect. Don't tell me about your what you think respect looks like. Tell me your stories of it. And what are your stories of disrespect? And then let's pull from that the agreements that will actually be meaningful to both students, teacher, parents. And if you're going to do it with students, you might as well do it with staff. Let's have a staff respect agreement. Staff member to staff member, staff to admin, admin to staff, um, and maybe our, our, our meeting norms. And so the book really helps people walk through this stuff so that it and i really wanted it to be a framework so it doesn't go in depth about any particular in anything because there's so much written already i don't want to rewrite the book that have already been written but um you know i, I wanted to give people a framework of how this work uh speaking of the uh, police officers that helped me out um <laughs> I see his name flash on the screen. Nice. Uh, I really want this book to be a framework. So, you know, there's a whole chapter in there on Ross Green's work of collaborative and proactive solutions, which I'm a big Ross Green fan. Mm -hmm. um, and Ross actually gave me a lot of guidance in writing that chapter. Um, there's some, you know, I brought in some other people to give me, uh, just really help me write these chapters. And so there's a little bit of ghostwriting from some, some folks there uh, because I wanted to make sure I got it right. Um, and so I, I really hope that this book is, is something teachers can use and administrators can use as a framework. You still need to go out and bring in the Ross Green people. You still need to partner with your local mental health agency to get you know community mental health folks in there to work on trauma. You still need to partner with your food pantry to make sure every kid's got access to food. This book isn't gonna help you do any of that. You're still gonna have to do that stuff. Um, but this gives you a framework of what a restorative, trauma-informed, equitable school could look like. And, you know, I think that's the power of a framework, right? People are going to make it their own, and people are going to make their adjustments in their community, but at least they have the framework to move through the process. And as a principal who started a process at my school with no framework, it's really challenging. And I and, and I, uh, Beth Waters asked a question about – you know, what does it take to change a teacher's mindset of a child being sent to the office and, and, and de-escalated for punishment? And yeah. I think too, you know, trauma informed practices or restorative justice isn't like a program that we do, right? It's who we are. It, it builds capacity. So how do you answer that question? I certainly know how I answer it, but how do you answer that question? How do we change the mindsets uh, when, when kids are coming to maybe to the office and being de-escalated as opposed to being punished. I, I'm going to borrow off my friend, Greg Kenyon, or yeah, yeah, um, Jeff Kenyon. Uh, Jeff uh, is the assistant principal at a school. And we were in circle once. And, and one of the things that he said just struck me. He's like, if you sent your spouse to someone else to fix your relationship problems, what that look like? You think I was a, look? You know, Matt. I'm gonna send you my husband. I want you to fix all his stuff and send him back with an apology. <laughs> You'd be like, dude, that's your problem. <laughs> but that's what we're doing with educators. You're sending your student out of the classroom to have somebody else fix your relationship problem. That doesn't work. The kid doesn't have a relationship problem with the people in the office. He's got a relationship problem back in his classroom. And so you can get him de-escalated at the office, but the relationship problem is still back in the classroom. And so sending your kids out of the room to solve a relationship problem that's in the room isn't helping you. 
Here's the catch though. And I know a lot of teachers are like, but what am I supposed to do? I have 30 other kids. Spend your first couple weeks of that year building the relationships that allow this to happen. You circle process, pass that talking piece. Really ask the, I, I know an educator, he was educator of the year twice in his life. Every year at the beginning of the year, he told me the same thing. He said, I play, ask me anything. And he lets his students ask him any question under the sun. And you think they'd ask a bunch of inappropriate stuff. They don't. They ask like, where'd you go to school? What kind of car do you drive? But that relationship, see, teachers have a thing. They say, and you, I can't even tell you how many workshops I've done where teachers say, look, I have a good relationship with my students. I know them very well. And I'm like, you know them really well, but do they know you really well? Because when you know them really well, that's not a relationship. That's called stalking. <laughs> and so we really have to rethink what does it mean to have a relationship with students. It's not them. It's not you knowing them. It's them getting to know and trust and feel safe with you. And then they want to behave for you. And when they're having a meltdown, they'll let you help. That's it. But you, you have to have a relationship to get that. You and know, Joe, and I, I will challenge every administrator um, at my school, we do this for the first 10 days. There's no academics allowed. The first 10 days are strictly about community building connection. And, and we, you know, we use the leader in me. So it's, it's tying into that seven habits of highly effective people in a community way. And I will tell you, it's a game changer. We actually build it into our schedule. And then after that 10 days, we actually have our morning meeting, morning community meetings in our schedule. We have our closing circles in our schedule. So we we surpass that. I just don't have time. And my theory is if you don't know, like if you, you have to have time, it's what we do. We're social and emotional beings. We want to connect. And so I want to challenge all administrators. If, if you are running a school the first 10 days, even coming back in January, it's time to reconnect. Let's go back and do the first 10 days of just reconnecting because it is a game changer for kids and adults. And if they did it with their staff, that's what we do as well. It's a game changer. That's how trust is built, right? Vulnerability, connection, relationships. So I, I, I'm over here amening and my hands are up in the air because so powerful. And that analogy of sending your spouse to someone else to fix, Joe, I hate to be, I tell you, man, that one's going to come out many, many times on this show from now on. That was so spot on. Yeah. Is one of my friend Jeff, Jeff credit for that one. Well, Jeff, uh, you rock okay. because that is awesome. I mean, uh, such a great analogy that you can connect to. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and it's something that you know you the time thing I think that you're talking about is also really important. Is that teachers say, "Well, I don't have time for this," but yet you spend the time anyway. You spend the right. time in. in I, I went to a school. I actually wrote about this in the book too. I, I went to a school. This is when I very first started going into schools and doing this, and. I, I was still viewing this all as just conflict management, which I've sort of changed my way of thinking about that now. I, I, I met with this sixth grade team of teachers and they said, we have this one kid. Even the other kids are happy when this kid's absent because he causes so much disruption. And I said, well, how much one-on-one -on -one time do you spend with this kid? And they said, well, we don't have time for that. And I was like, you're spending time talking to me right now. You could be using the time that you're wasting talking to me, building a relationship with him and curbing his behavior. So when teachers say they don't have the time, I, you know, I'll borrow a line off Ross Green. Ross Green says that the only people asking him questions about time are people who are just starting out doing this work. Because the rest of them that have been doing it for a few years already figured out how much time they're going to buy back by becoming a trauma-informed restorative school. Mm-hmm. Because instead of your kids being hungry, tired, irritable, dysregulated, they're ready to learn. And when they're not ready to learn, there's a system in place to get them there. That's exactly and what I was going to say. So powerful, right? Because, and here's the thing, Joe, we all have bad days. Kids are no different. And I think from an administrator's perspective, we have to operate in this same space with our teachers and our educators, 
we've got to be able to connect in this same space with our educators and the people we work with at school. You know, it's one thing if I'm operating and I'm writing all the teachers up because they're not doing what I told them to do. And then I'm telling them to be empathetic or be pre operate in a pre forgiven mindset. Right. But if I'm showing that, then I'm modeling, right? And it takes that time to connect and do this over time. So I think that's so important of, we have time. Um, and I, I always say this, uh, I say this often in my school, what we find is important, we'll find the time, what we don't, we'll find an excuse. And at the end of the day, that's how it, that's how it works. But you, you strike a really good point too about teachers. All of this stuff applies to staff. Trauma-informed schools, must be trauma-informed workplaces mm -hmm. it, or, or, or it's not really you're not really doing it because if if your teachers you know you you, you had eric grossen on here that talked about you know social relevance and, and flock you know that syndrome of like how our emotions are contagious which is also in my book and um if, if teachers are walking in the classroom dysregulated, stressed out, haven't had a pee break, which by the way, our educational you know, makeup in this country glorifies this burned out busy thing, which is so unhealthy for teachers. Like, you know, six period and you haven't even gone to pee screams urinary tract infection. But mm -hmm. let's not talk about that. Let's not talk about how we're beating up and hurting teachers and then making jokes about it and trying to make light of it rather than changing it because it's not healthy for them, but it's also not healthy for students because stressed out adults stress out children. And so even a child that's not dysregulated could become dysregulated because of dysregulated adults. And, and so we have to stop with this whole like, you know, glorifying, uh, you know, burned out and busy. As, as if teachers aren't really doing their job if they say, yeah, I'm well rested and all my lesson plans are done and <laughs> that should be okay. And that needs to be modeled from, from administrators. Like I unapologetically disconnect all the time. I have a cabin. I don't have internet. I don't have TV. We don't, our cell phones don't work. And I tell my staff, I'm gone for the weekend. I can't literally cannot talk to anybody. And I don't feel bad about that. And I tell them the same thing, like disconnect. It's time to disconnect. There's no badge of honor. If you're in the parking lot at seven, I'm not going to be there at seven. And I'm going to tell you, you need to go home. Um, but uh, you're right. There's this weird badge of honor for driving ourselves into the dirt. And that's not realistic. And it certainly isn't healthy. Um, and I think, I think, teacher to teacher accountability. I don't know if you uh, listened to Dana Thomas. She's the happy teacher revolution founder where it was about teachers connecting to 12 choices and then living out their professional lives under those 12 choices and being able, one of my favorite is disconnect and love. I, I think what you said is so important and it's part of all of this. It's part of trauma informed and restorative justice because a dysregulated adult cannot regulate a dysregulated child. We know that. And so it starts with us, man, that's powerful. Yeah. And I think both restorative justice and the principles of trauma informed give us sort of a framework to build these relationships. And, and importantly, and I, I think this is the part that might get missed in schools right now, which I think is important uh, as we do the work of trauma informed and we do the work of restorative practice, we always have to acknowledge where these ideas came from. And, and that's one of the things I think that, that is happening right now is that we've, we've taken these ideas of restorative justice and um, there are organizations and people out there teaching this work and sharing this work without acknowledging where these ideas came from. And you know the ideas of, of restorative justice come from indigenous thinking, the Maori people of New Zealand, Aborigines of Australia, uh, Native Americans here in the United States, uh, Mexico, uh, First Nation people of Canada, uh, the Inuit of the Arctic. I, you know, in not all, but most indigenous folks um, 
did not scream and yell and punish their children until white people showed up and started causing that change. And so if you, if you read, I'm a big fan of um, uh, Stacey Patton, who uh, writes a lot about how it's just not, it's not part of most cultures until colonization came to hit and yell and guilt and punish and reward children. Like this stuff didn't start until European white people showed up. So if you look at Indian culture, you look at Maori culture, you look at uh, um, the culture of Aborigines, uh, many Native Americans, they, they don't hit their children. And, and the idea of it, I, I spent three and a half weeks in India studying Jainism. And part of it was it was a, a teaching for peace program where they took us into Jain schools. Well, in Jainism, hitting your children and punishing your children would be considered violence. And since it's a karmic religion, that would result in the, the accumulation of karma. Um, and so you would never do that. Their entire school systems do not have punishment as part of the system. They don't yell at kids. They don't hit kids. They don't suspend kids or take things away. They say, oh, you messed up. Let's get you back on track. And it's all about the support. And so we went to this one Jane school and, and I'm a bit of a cynic and I was even worse back then. And I asked this, this group of teachers, I was like, come on, come on, you know, you give in. I said, so what do you do when you have that student who's like really disruptive, you know, defiant. I'm, and in the back of my head, I'm going, they're going to tell me they use punishment now. And this one, you know, teacher, uh, this was in New Delhi, this one teacher. And I said, what do you do with that kid? She's like, oh, when that happens, we bring them to the, to the front of the room and every student reminds them how much they are loved. Here's the part that got me though. That's not what got me. It's when I looked around the room at all my Western friends who were all like, and all the Indian teachers are looking at us like, what's wrong with you? Why would you ask that? And, they should have asked. And that's my moment that you. I realized. <laughs> I'm kidding. They were, they were like, we don't you? do that to our kids. <laughs> wow. I mean, you know, and, and isn't it ironic that all of these uh, practices are so rooted in so many places, but those roots have been pulled and this new way of thinking has taken over because it's so true. And you know, this, and I think there are cultures that look at us and go, what is going on with, with this? Not, not, and I'm talking about like, even now looking at the U S going, what is going on? Well, they're definitely doing that. <laughs> <laughs> because I talk to people around the globe and they ask me what is going on. Right. And I think we're even at a more heightened state of what you described as a aggressive culture, a punishment driven culture. It's 10, the intensity has increased because that is the responses that have been put out there. But we know, and you know, and the science is clear, it isn't effective. So we're right now in a time of natural disruption with COVID, with, with political shifts. There's just a, a disruption that's happening across our culture, right? Whether it's uh, a man made of, of, of the political, or if it's natural and that's the COVID, right? How do you see your book fitting into this opportunity? And of course, of course, I'm insanely optimistic during these times of going, man, this is a great time where, where educators can really start being innovative. How do you see your book wedging into this space for educators to push their thinking, to push their practice, um, moving into the future? I, it, you know, I could I could say it this way. In almost every workshop I've ever done for educators, there's some educator in the room that says, Joe, which one of my, how will I know which of my students have been exposed to trauma and which ones haven't? And I would explain, well, we don't know. We use universal precautions, blah, blah, blah. But now my answer is different. Now the answer is, how will I know which kids? It's all of them. 100% of our children have been exposed to collective trauma. A, a pandemic is trauma. Racism is trauma. Political unrest is trauma. 
not knowing if if your loved ones are safe from COVID is trauma. And now these kids are going to be coming back with immense grief that the whole world as they know it is gone. So we need this work more now than we ever have. And my book, I hope, is a framework for this new school. I don't want to call it a new normal because I think normal is a weird word to start with. But this new place that we need to be if we're going to protect our children from toxic stress. We need a framework. And I'm not going to tell you that my book's the framework. I'm going to tell you that I hope it is. I'm going to tell you that I hope people can take from it and wake up the wisdom they already have. That's what this book is meant to do. This book isn't meant to tell you how that, you know, like I'm telling you this is the way to do it. What I'm telling you is that you already have the wisdom within your school to make your school exactly what it needs to be. And with the right guidance and allowing the right voices to speak and lifting them, they're gonna make your school trauma-informed and restorative without ever doing much more. It, you just have to let the sort of wisdom of your school surface. So, and, so powerful. And again, I've said this too. <laughs> I've said this in my own building. You all, nobody's coming to save us. Nobody's coming, yes. right? Like nobody's coming with the answer. And and even when I speak, the in I always tell people that I speak to, I'm going to tell you what the answer is when I before I leave. We are the answer. Like we are the answer to our problems when we're working together to come up with better solutions when we're coming using current research and current neuroscience and current studies to to adjust how we're operating and so i cannot i mean i resonate with that so much because i tell that to my staff all the time we have i have an, a brilliant i work with a brilliant staff and they have so many remarkable ideas that I just say, we're going to try. Let's innovate. Exactly. Let's, what, what's the worst thing that, that could happen? It may not work. If we only waited until 100% of things worked 100% of the time in education, we wouldn't do anything. And so I love that you're saying it could be a framework and try it out. So my last question, Joe, and I told you, this 45 minutes was going to go fast. And boy, <laughs> did it ever go fast, right? Um, and I just appreciate you digging so deeply, amazing information for myself and all of the listeners. But if you can tell educators out there one thing right now, what is it? I think the thing I want to tell you is that kid that's sitting in the back of your classroom with a big smile on his face might not be the happiest kid in the classroom. So don't, don't look at them and go, oh, he's fine because he's not fine. Because that was me. That was me in the in the classroom. I was a happy, smiley little kid. And then I wasn't happy. There was a lot of stuff going on in my house. There was a lot of stuff going on around me. And I was a young gay kid in a Catholic school being told I'm going to burn in hell. I was a little freaked out as a kid. And so I smiled a lot because smiling is a fight or flight defense. Uh, giggling is a, is a fight or flight defense. And so that kid that's in your classroom with the big smile on their face Check in with them. They might not be as happy as you think they are. And that kid that's really looking miserable might actually be fine. Like, don't judge them by what you, because what you think is going on is probably not what's going on. You know, I, I ask all the time, what does trauma, what does a student with trauma look like and sound like? And I get all of the time throwing chairs, to come on, you know, non compliant. And I always say, what about the class clown? What about the kid who is diverting all of that um, that potential digging into what's actually going on? Because that was me. I was the class clown. Everybody loved being around me because I was silly all the time. But internally, I was fighting fights and battles about things that were happening around me. And people had no idea. So I appreciate that. We can never assume anything about anyone, especially our kids. And I also think too, just because a kid lives in poverty doesn't mean they're traumatized. Doesn't mean they don't have support systems. Is it highly and correlated? Potentially. But some kids that are in poverty have great structures of support systems, right? Exactly. So I think we have to be really cognizant of those biases that we possess. And I think what you just described is yeah. bias, right? 
Go in, go uh, into some schools. I I got really schooled fast when I started going into schools that are in really well-off neighborhoods. So here in Connecticut, you know, we have some really well-off neighborhoods. Some of the most unbelievable trauma that I saw. For one thing, bullying. You know, you go into an urban school and kids fight, they they do stuff online, but the fight, they do a fair five and they're done. <laughs> I went to the schools where they have money. They would they would build websites to tear each other down. Like the the level of that just meant they had more resources for their bullying. It literally it was it was shocking. Mm -hmm. But I also in one of the school districts here in Connecticut that I work, um, they they literally call uh, call it a uh, affluence sort of disease where kids freshman in high school who's just trying to figure himself out is being pushed to fill out co college applications for Yale. By, by the first week of freshman year. Literally, these kids are suicidal because the pressure being put on them to be successful doctors and lawyers, and, and they're like, yeah, I wanna be a painter. Mm -hmm. and not having it. They like, their parents will disown them if they're not like on a, on a college track. And, and so don't think you know what trauma looks like because you saw some kid you know, at the food pantry. He's fine. He has food, his parents love him. They just don't have money. But some of those kids that have money, their parents don't have any time for them. And, and their idea of, of, of attunement and relationship is from a nanny and it's the fifth one this year. Like, don't think you know what trauma looks like for any kid, because you don't. So true. And, and Joe, if people want to buy your book, where can they get it? And if they want to follow you on social media, where can they find you? Um, so the book, I would very much um, feel amazingly honored if people would go to local um, LGBTQ bookstores or black owned bookstores and any bookstore can order you this book from Jessica Kingsley Publishers. So any bookstore will get it for you. But if you could support locally owned or um, bookstores that are LGBT owned, that are black owned, that are indigenous owned, go, go, you know, I love Amazon just like the next guy because they're quick and, you know, I have Prime and it comes the next day and they have enough money. Um, follow me. Um, I am at Twitter at, at Joe Brummer. Um, and then my website is just my name, joebrummer.com. Um, and I just actually had it redone. So it's not perfectly finished, but it's freshed up. Um, so feel free to visit and, and, and check it out. Thank you so much. And, and Joe, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your book. Um, I got to pre-read it. So I, I was very appreciative to be able to do that and to, to just give my little stamp of, oh my goodness, this is awesome. Every educator needs to, to read it. So thank you for, for putting that book together for all of us to be able to learn from you. Um, if you like the podcast, you can follow me on principal list on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Matthew Portell on Facebook. And as always, please, please, please wash your hands and wear a mask. All right, Joe, that is the done of the recording part of it. So we are still live, but I just, uh, I want to sincerely thank you. I mean, an amazing book with so much amazing knowledge and uh, for you sharing it with me and those of, uh, of us that are going to listen to it. I cannot thank you enough. And uh, for your vulnerability, you shared a lot of things that um, it took takes vulnerability. And I appreciate that because I can tell you, um, I felt connected to it and I know that other people will too. So thank you, man. I appreciate it. If I can ever be thank a since you know I'm here for you and thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, man. See you later.